Uh, hello, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. We are starting just in one minute. Waiting for more students to join if anyone else is going to join. Uh, hello once again. So today, as you can see, we're going to discuss the Ethereum technology. We have already covered the first widespread blockchain technology, which was the Bitcoin blockchain. Then we dwelt on uh, some general characteristics and in particular on uh, consensus protocols, starting from the original uh, Byzantine fault tolerance and uh, ending with uh, a modern incarnation which was hot stuff BFT by the way for your information uh, I am going to uh, send uh, actually both to Moodle and to our telegram channel the original papers uh, the first one of Lester Lampard of 1982 uh, and then the paper on uh, Byzantine fault tolerance uh, in hotspot uh, implementation. <clears throat> so you can see uh, those original uh, publications on uh, these protocols, although we have discussed them in very much detail and there are examples not available in the original papers. Okay, so today we are going to discuss uh, the second generation uh, blockchain technology, which is Ethereum, uh, its uh, key technology features, its architecture, uh, advantages, disadvantages, and 
uh, why it is actually so important and why it was indeed a turnaround of blockchain technologies and distributed ledger technologies as we know them. <clears throat> so if you remember, as a recap, uh, these are uh, typical components of any blockchain. So first of all, uh, because it is a distributed database uh, with track of all transactions and peer-to-peer -peer communications, then we must have a peer-to-peer -peer network. So there is no central server apart from a kind of, uh, well, we do need uh, some peer discovery mechanism, which is not centralized, but it requires some prior knowledge. So for example, you may begin with a list which you download from somewhere of uh, actively uh, active uh, nodes. Uh, you go to those active nodes, you discover other peers, and eventually you build a local database uh, of uh, known peers. Obviously, some of them can some of them can go on and off, but uh, you need to be in touch with at least one peer to, to, to get connected with at least one peer and know which address somehow so that you can eventually crawl uh, nearly the whole peer-to-peer -peer network and get more and more and more uh, peers uh, to operate with. Obviously, the more you have, is the better. This is typically uh, a function of uh, a node implementation, uh, which is called peer discovery. Uh, it is present in any blockchain implementation. Excuse me? Yes, yes, please. Uh do we have some kind of tracker uh, node which tracks uh, a list of peers uh, in the moment? Uh, you see that the answer is of course yes. And the answer is it is each and every node which tracks uh, the list of peers available to it but there is no central node or central uh, because you know once uh, once you have a central node as a central let's say naming service still centralized then the whole scheme becomes vulnerable uh, an adversary can attack or destroy this naming service and then other peers cannot discover other peers so it appears to be a vulnerability right it is a problem. So how it is done? It is done by crawling the network of peers. So you need to get to at least one peer. Yes, unfortunately, that's the step number one which you must take. Where do you get this first peer from? Oh, uh, it must be available from somewhere else. So yes, there might be some web services uh, which unofficial, not part of the network. They're helpers only. You can't rely upon them, uh, but uh, which probably give you at least one peer. And if you get connected to at least one peer, then you discover all other peers connected to that one. You go to them and discover all peers connected to them and so on and so on. So you crawl uh expanding exponentially uh the whole network and accumulate a local database of as many nodes as you can uh you may get some just you know statically pre-configured uh, local database which you probably got from a previous run of your network or you got it from a friend or you got it from somewhere but if you don't have any single entry point, then you can't connect. And by the way, such problems are realistic. Uh, I would like to ask you, okay, uh, apart from blockchains, which we are studying here, have you been running any peer-to-peer -peer networks? Yes. Which, which, which ones? Distributed uh, peer-to-peer -peer database. 
Oh, which one? Our own implementation, actually. Oh, your own implementation. Okay, that's great. And in that implementation, how do you solve this uh, node discovery problem? Uh, we have uh, kept the list of known nodes, which uh, was broadcasted for all the nodes, by each node, some kind of that. Um, okay, but that's for connected nodes. If someone completely from completely out, we have a hard coded list of nodes. Hard coded, okay, that's a possibility. Although, again, not a very a robust one because what if uh, you know your internet provider has disconnected you and uh, all those IP addresses uh, or even host names become become invalid. There is no general solution. Yes, it could be a hard coded list. It could be a database or the initial node which you download from somewhere. It could be just uh, I don't know a Telegram group. If if you got completely stuck, you ask people there. Okay, give me just one IP address I can connect. I can connect to, and then uh, the protocol would automatically discover all other nodes. Uh, I quite often run peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks, which is which are called uh, Amule and Kademlia. Have you heard about them? Can you repeat please about what? Peer-to-peer um, -peer networks, which are called uh, ED2K, Emule, and Kademlia. Uh, clients like uh, Emule, A, A Mule uh, for, for decentralized files downloading. Okay. Uh, some of the books I have sent to you previously, they come from those peer-to-peer -peer networks. No, they're not official. Sometimes. You need to download them from somewhere. And especially Kademlia is uh, a very, I would say, well-established, useful peer-to-peer uh, -peer network for file exchange. So lots of useful books can be found there. And at some point, I got, uh, don't remember how it happened, uh, I got to a situation that I couldn't initialize my connection. So I didn't know, my client didn't know any single node to connect to. And then there is a problem of how to bootstrap your connections. I had to use secondary sources. So basically, yes, do web search, give me some initial hardwired list of IP addresses. I can begin with. So eventually I got a not very up-to-date list of IP addresses, but fortunately uh, some of them were still working. And eventually this peer-to-peer uh, -peer client managed to bootstrap itself by connecting to those which were accepting connections, getting other peers from them, and eventually building up its more or less complete local database but that's a real problem in peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks so basically the more frequently you use them and the larger your local database of peer is the better if for example you are on an ethereum client continuously and it continuously keeps track of uh, other peers because you crawl the network uh, then the chances are very high you would be always online. You wouldn't get disconnected. Whereas if you had a node, didn't run it for a year, and then you switch it on, the chances are maybe none of the IP addresses which were in your original database are valid by that time. Oh, very few. And you would have to bootstrap your peer-to-peer uh, -peer network from somewhere, somehow, by external means, precisely as I did. Okay. Now, uh, we know that uh, there are messages, transactions, and other messages. So in uh, Bitcoin, uh, all messages were actually transactional ones. 
uh, whereas uh, in Ethereum there are at least two principal kinds of messages uh, transactions and smart contract deployment messages uh, which are transactions from the point of view that they do alter the state of the system when a new smart contract is deployed but they are not transactions in the financial sense they are not not, not data or financial transactions so these are somehow orthogonal um, kinds of messages uh, in any way they update the distributed state of our database but in order to update what we call the distributed state we must first of all have this distributed state a union of incoherent local states of your nodes is not a distributed state distributed state we can only say as uh, over as a unified state it becomes available only if we have some kind of consensus protocol and we have a way to uh, in particular secure uh, this consensus by forming legitimate and recognized by the majority of nodes chains of uh, in many cases chains uh, here is a blockchain uh, chains of uh, transaction blocks or uh, maybe individual transactions which are uh, which can be forked but then due to a consensus protocol they merge uh, again into a consistent state and most of the time we do have a unified uh, distributed state accepted by the majority of nodes as we discussed for example first of all in uh, the blockchain in the bitcoin blockchain example and then in various byzantine fault tolerance uh, byzantine consensus algorithms examples uh, because typically the task for securing at least the public network is computationally intensive uh, then It comes at some cost in bitcoin it comes at the cost of cpu time uh, and eventually electricity therefore uh, because it is a proof of work uh, algorithm which is still uh, widely used as we discussed in public uh, distributed ledger public uh, implementations uh, because of that those who do the work of securing the scheme must be rewarded somehow so they must have incentive to continue operating that way and there is a scheme for paying them transaction fees or mining new uh, cryptocurrencies uh, in a way uh, which keep them operating and finally there is a client software uh, which uh, is typically called but not necessarily just you know wallet software uh, which allows you to uh, keep track of your uh, smart contracts uh, funds uh, and transactions it was a relatively simplistic although still not that much simplistic for bitcoin even bitcoin uh, had not only the simplest type of transactions uh, just from a to b as you remember you could create uh, a number of different transaction types including for example crowdfunding and uh, in that case uh, slight variations in transaction scripts these stack, stack machines were available all those had to be created by your client software typically you wouldn't uh, as an end user you wouldn't bother with uh, creating and submitting these transactions in a row messages over the network uh, moreover for let us recap for bitcoin although a common paradigm is that you have wallets and you have wallet addresses 
but let us still recap do uh, do we have really wallets in the sense of uh, let's say client accounts uh, in uh, the bitcoin uh, blockchain so is there really such a notion that you have that many bitcoins on your account so there is an account or let's say a wallet uh, and you have a certain amount of bitcoins on your account from just the layman point of view from the end user housewife's point of view or her, 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 how to call it yes so you receive a transaction on your account and uh, yes your your wallet software demonstrates that you do have it but in fact when you receive something what does it mean uh, you if we recall uh, the bitcoin Can you please repeat? Uh, my question is, uh, from what we already know about uh, the Bitcoin blockchain and how it operates, when we say that there is a transaction and, for example, you received one Bitcoin on your wallet with a certain address, you received one Bitcoin on your wallet, what does it actually mean? does it actually mean that uh, you have a wallet uh, with a given address uh, and uh, there are some funds like a bank account which fell into this address or it means something from 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 uh, i would say the outside point of view yes you got a transaction to your wallet address but how actually is it implemented in a bitcoin blockchain do you really have wallets with addresses there is a message in the chat there is a message in the chat let's see what the message says me should have no. it you're, you're right it says no we have utxo instead and you are right uh which means that basically your wallet is a very dynamic feature there is no wallet by itself uh, your wallet is current wallet is formed by all utx source to which you have access and you have access to those utx source which for example for example name your hashed public key as a recipient and then if you are in the possession of the corresponding private key then all those utxos dynamically dynamically make up your wallet if uh, you have a number of public keys and the corresponding number of private keys then dynamically uh, all transactions uh, which destined to uh, those public keys given by their hashes actually they make up your wallet moreover if there are transactions and we have seen uh, examples of them with uh, unspecified destinations that might be the source is specified the destination is not then they would be automatically included by everyone's wallet and remain there until spent but obviously once spent then this utxo from unspent becomes spent and cannot be executed anymore so the wallet is completely dynamic for bitcoin <clears throat> for ethereum as we will see the wallets are indeed static so you do have accounts and there are funds which are associated not with utxos but with uh, really with your uh, account ids for ethereum and then there is a problem of avoiding double spend uh, of preventing double spend uh, double spending of funds uh, on your account 
because uh, if you initiate a certain transaction, then probably everyone can uh, initiate once again the same transaction. And uh, it is not a UTXO which becomes immediately invalid after uh, it was used as a source of uh, a subsequent transaction, it is your account. So then there is a question actually what to do about this. And this question is resolved uh, in Ethereum. You can probably get that it is not very difficult to solve this problem and indeed there is a very simple way of how it is done. Okay, and the client software is more sophisticated uh, in case of uh, Ethereum compared to uh, Bitcoin. So a brief uh, history of uh, Ethereum development. So in the fall of 2013, the idea of Turing complete blockchain scripting was proposed by Vitalik Buterin. Uh, at that time, it was only an idea. Implementation took a year and a half. Uh, from early 2014 to mid-15 uh, and it couldn't be accomplished uh, single-handedly. It required a consortium uh, to be established with uh, most uh, uh, prominent, uh, prominent figures uh, in this consortium being Buterin himself, Andreas Antonopoulos uh, and Glenn Wood, uh, computer scientist from the UK, uh, they eventually developed a uh, Turing complete scripting for uh, a next generation uh, blockchain. And already at that time, uh, they viewed this as a Web3, something like third generation of web technology. So what, what is meant by that? Um, the original World Wide Web as appeared in 1990s, or the very first technology even in late 1980s, but it is actually 1990s when uh, it became uh, really, really important, was based on uh, HTTP 1.0 and 1.1 uh, protocols and effectively tailored to delivery of static content. So obviously there was a concept of a web server, and uh, clients connecting, uh, receiving uh, static or maybe computed on the fly uh, content, but then again, in order to receive it, you would have to make yet another HTTP 1.1, for example, request to the server. So you still remember HTTP 1.1, it is even up to now uh, in widespread use, all right? Uh, what is bad about this? It is server centric. It is quite poorly supporting generation of truly dynamic content. So if for example, you connect to a financial exchange and you need to receive constant updates uh, at the time as uh, they occur on the server side. How would you do it with uh, HTTP 1.1? Through long polling? By polling, right? You would simply do yeah, it by yeah. polling and there is no other way, which is not a very good idea because you simply overload the server by your polling requests even if the server has nothing to respond. And when the server does have data to send to you, because it is still a, a pool or poll uh, to that end based uh, protocol rather than push based. So the server has no way of pushing data to you. Uh, then you would probably get some delay, which would on average be half of your polling period before you are able to uh, before you are able to receive your data. Okay, so not a very good idea. Uh, then 
in what was becoming web generation two, uh, starting in uh, late 1990s and early 2000s, uh, this problem was somehow solved in the web technologies. So what was the first important uh, advent uh, which allowed us to uh, circumvent this uh, polling only uh, limitation of HTTP 1.1? What have we received? from the web technologies point of view. There was HTTP 1.1 and what then? HTTP 2.0? Well, 2.0 is a wonderful and nice thing, really, but uh, that came later. The web sockets? Web sockets, of course, you are right. So web sockets are extension, by the way, of 1.1, not of 2.0. You can't, uh, in general, it is not in 2.0 standard. You can't convert a 2.0 HTTP connection into a web socket. Mostly because there is no need to. If you have HTTP 2.0, then yes, uh, you can have server initiated push frames and then web circuits become obsolete and unnecessary in that case but web circuits are developed from around 2003 2004 uh, they were extremely important in providing dynamic uh, content uh, and dynamic exchange of information between the client and the server. So first of all, uh, you had server initiated pushes in that case, but uh, you could also get uh, client initiated uh, data flow, not uh, in the form of uh, standardized requests, but in the form of arbitrary uh, message communications uh, on top of uh, this WebSocket protocol. And then to support uh, a portable data format, uh, there was also a certain format developed for that, which is typically used, not necessarily, but typically used uh, for web circuit communication. So which format is it? JSON, all right? Because web circuits are only possible if supported by JavaScript, uh, by the corresponding JavaScript technology running on the client side, or, well, any technology supporting it. If it is a browser, then typically it is, uh, it is a uh, JavaScript, uh, which allows you to create a client side web circuit. And then uh, JavaScript support this uh, JSON uh, format effectively. Uh, very simple but uh, sufficient uh, term structure of maps and lists uh, in text-based encoding, uh, which uh, runs uh, in uh, web circuit communications. And then uh, HTTP 2.0 came quite recently. It was already in uh, the first attempt to uh, standardize. It was in 2012. Uh, finally standardized, I think, in around 2014, uh, already used sufficiently. Uh, it is a wide, uh, widely accepted uh, technology. Uh, there is very good, uh, there is a set of very good features of HTTP 2.0 uh, compared to 1.1, uh, in particular that your communications are now framed. So you are not receiving uh, a stream of data which the application needs to parse, but you have streams and streams travel, uh, sorry, you have uh, frames and frames traveling both ways, actually client to server and server to client, which uh, makes it uh, much easier to, uh, at a slight overhead of providing uh, just lenses of uh, binary encoded 
uh, frames, uh, which makes it much easier to parse and to implement uh, control and data flow in HTTP2. But still, it is a server-centric technology. What we call Web2 is performance enhanced with the help of first, uh, uh, of first uh, web sockets and then HTTP2, but it is still not peer-to-peer. -peer. It is server-centric web technology. At the same time, there was another important development starting in 1990s originally not part of web development, but uh, one which, in addition to web technologies proper, quickly becoming popular. I'm talking about grid computing. Have you ever run any grid applications uh, on uh, your machines? Like, for example, trying to discover extraterrestrial intelligence signals in your screensaver perhaps you remember this set here at home yeah yeah okay did you did, did you get any uh, discernible signal uh well i don't know i just computed some things maybe they did in seti oh okay so maybe but you 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 have not been notified of that uh yes uh so grid computing um uh, became a very popular topic by the end of the 1990s and early 2000s. There was a number of <coughs> uh, grid technologies uh, developed. For example, Globus uh, was the first one. Nowadays, uh, a popular grid computing technology is Condor. Uh, you have probably been using it. Uh, which is uh, quite uh, useful if you really need to run numerically, computationally intensive uh, operations over a large network of available computers. But I would say grid computing is mostly for CPU intensive rather than network and data intensive applications. Typically, how your grid computing works. You submit a job uh, which has a relatively small set of inputs and outputs, but a large uh, computational load which is required in order to convert your inputs into outputs. And then you wait for uh, those results to come back to your controlling node and then you submit it again, submit to other computers available over the grid uh, and so on. So the network traffic is relatively small. So grid computing is suitable uh, for even for those without very fast uh, internet connectivity. You are not sending gigabytes of data, but yes, uh, it may be demanding on the CPU. Whereas Web3, as envisioned by the Ethereum proponents, is actually both network intensive and CPU intensive. It is network intensive because, first of all, in order to bootstrap your node, you need to download uh, the whole Ethereum, for example, blockchain. And the Ethereum blockchain is larger. I would say by far larger than Bitcoin blockchain. Okay, what are the size, uh, roughly, of course, we can't say exactly, but roughly the size of uh, Bitcoin blockchain. If you start a Bitcoin node, a few gigabytes, not extremely large. What is the size of data uh, associated with the full Ethereum blockchain if you start it? Roughly, what do you think? Maybe a few uh, hundred megabytes or maybe? No, uh, not hundreds of megabytes because uh, the Bitcoin is already in the gigabyte range. In that uh, case, maybe hundreds of 
gigabytes. Hundreds of gigabytes, yes. Uh, about two years ago, it turned uh, into 100 gigabytes and it is all 100 now. Yes. But still well on the terabyte. Not prohibitive given a large size of modern hard drives. So it is not a problem, but it is substantial. And the larger size of, bit of uh, Ethereum blockchain is precisely due to a larger variety of transactions which are available. So it is not only monetary transfers from A to B. Uh, these are general Turing complete smart contracts which are updating the state. And then, uh, so it was quite quite recently actually, uh, in uh, summer of 2015, uh, by the end of July 2015, when block zero was hashed, uh, so six and a half years later, uh, after uh, the initial block was hashed, uh, the Genesis block was hashed for uh, the Bitcoin blockchain, then Ethereum came, came to life. Uh, Ethereum uses a completely different design philosophy compared to Bitcoin. So effectively, um, in the Bitcoin technology, in both technologies, actually, it is the common term for um, uh, blockchain technology development. Uh, there is a notion uh, you have no doubt heard about it, and we discussed it briefly, of a hard fork. So what is a hard fork? A hard fork is a fork in the code base, which is incompatible with the previous operation of the node software. So either the majority of nodes upgrade and then they continue operation of the same data in our blockchain, but with new software incompatible with others, or it may happen that, uh, let's say the majority of nodes, I, I reject this fork, or the or they are split uh, nearly 50-50 uh, between the proponents of the new technology of the new fork and um, the conservative nodes which retain the previous technology. And in that case, indeed, a split, uh, split occurs. Typically, and that's why uh, Bitcoin is very, very, very conservative on hard forks. Uh, in order not to, what happens, uh, for example, if certain nodes did not accept uh, a hard fork, then the data uh, uh, are actually split as well. Because if uh, old nodes continue to operate with uh, the old data, uh, the transactions initiated by them are no longer accepted by new nodes and vice versa. Because the transactions in Bitcoin are monetary transactions, this means that this whole space of transactions is effectively split between the two. It means that eventually and very soon the unspent transaction outputs would be either picked up uh, by uh, the new nodes or continue to uh, being picked up by the old nodes, but they are no longer cross compatible. So uh, these forks will become permanent, not only in the code base, but also in the blockchain, which means typically a split in the value of the underlying of, of the corresponding cryptocurrency. So typically you would expect the value, let's say the dollar value of your cryptocurrency being reduced if there is a technology fork. Because now uh, in this technology fork, it is like uh, there are 
there is a multiplication of currencies. So basically now transactions could be doubled based on the same uh, original monetary BTC base. Uh, one branch of the fork accepted by the new technology, another one by the old ones, where the dollar value uh, of the whole uh, remain the same. Therefore, the dollar value for each individual uh, chain is halved, roughly. So this is very much financially detrimental uh, to have a split in uh, the code base, the fork in the code base. And in the Bitcoin history, a real hard fork, I mean a uh, hard fork uh, not previously agreed by the majority and which really split uh, the Bitcoin. Uh, it occurred how many times? Two or one? And once. In 2010, what, what the original Bitcoin is now called Bitcoin Classic with the name BCC, not BTC, but BCC. And it was still accepted by the very much majority. Uh, the minority who did not uh, actually accept it was precisely the minority who managed to steal funds. You remember it was due to a vulnerability resulted in a fund theft. And then the majority of legitimate, I would say, or uh, well-intended uh, users of the network, they decided to produce a deliberately backward incompatible upgrade or hard fork in order to marginalize uh, the sheets so that, uh, yes, uh, they got the funds, but the funds could not be used in the majority network anymore. And because the majority has uh, accepted uh, this hard fork, then uh, this BCC, uh, which is the rest, the stolen funds actually, became completely, uh, completely, I wouldn't say useless, but uh, nearly worthless. Okay, so that happened only once. All other technology upgrades uh, in uh, uh, in uh, Bitcoin, uh, they were very, very, very carefully planned and accepted by the vast majority of uh, participants. So only once uh, there was a hard fork uh, still accepted by the majority, but not uh, by the very prevailing majority, I would say. Whereas, uh, and that's why, by the way, uh, all those attempts to remove the one megabyte block size uh, in Bitcoin and replace it with 10 megabyte, it didn't come through yet. Because there is no consensus about this. And there are fear that if enforced, then there would be a sufficient percentage of dissenting uh, nodes uh, who will not accept it. And then uh, this would adversely affect the value of Bitcoin because not only the code base, but Bitcoin itself as monetary instrument would be split. But for Ethereum, it is not at all the case. Ethereum was originally as manifested by the consortium by Buterin, Antonopoulos and Wood, uh, when originally developed, designed for agile type of development. So yes, you would have incompatibilities, definitely. Typically, these incompatibilities, um, they wouldn't be in uh, the network protocol itself, but they would be uh, related to various API features of your smart contracts, which is available to you. And that's not prohibitive, because what can happen after such a, uh, such a fork, uh, a hard fork, uh, is that, well, yes, uh, the smart contracts you have previously deployed would become invalid, and you would need to, they cannot be removed uh, from the blockchain. Blockchain keeps 
the whole system but in order to make them working again uh, you would need to submit new uh, smart contracts possibly using new api and that's completely normal so uh, with the advent of flexible uh, smart contracts the community can accept frequent incompatible hard forks because lots of functionality is now not in the node uh, code which you would need to uh, in that case um, uh, upgrade uh, with possibly incompatible uh, changes uh, even to the data format but which can be managed at the level of your smart contract apis and that's much easier so with turing complete scripting uh, you got much more flexibility at the expense of uh, yes more uh, i would say dynamism uh, dynamics in your development and the need to upgrade your smart contracts and uh, indeed the upgrades are coming frequently so you see uh, after uh, the block zero hashed uh, then uh, those names in quotes are generations of ethereum uh, technology uh, so we are now already in a very advanced uh, uh, generation uh, the last upgrade uh, there was by the way an unintended one as well so due to a security uh, breach a very significant one when again about 40 million uh, ethereums uh, was about 40 million usd were stolen in 2016 then in incompatible uh, uh, hard fork was initiated in order to marginalize again the stolen funds uh, and continue uh, the legitimate path of Ethereum to operate. Um, we are still, in spite of many, many, many claims that Ethereum 2.0 is forthcoming, we are still in Ethereum 1.0. We are now in the generation called Mirror Glacier, uh, which came to life. Uh, on the first day of this year but it is still ethereum 1.0 which is based on proof of work rather than uh, the proof of stake which is declared for ethereum 2.0 this proof of stake uh, should tremendously increase uh, the throughput of the ethereum network but it is still in development with no firm dates dates to be confirmed uh, when actually it is going to go live so unfortunately uh, i think basically from 2015-16 we have already heard about ethereum 2.0 when just uh, 1.0 was uh, developing and developing but it didn't come to life yet let us consider an example of a smart contract. Uh, so first of all, um, what is important is that in Ethereum, there are two types of addresses. There are no unspent transaction outputs, so the addresses we are using, they are not addresses of transactions. They are really addresses of wallets or accounts. You open up an account and there is a permanent uh, address associated with it. Uh, there are two types of accounts. The first type is called EOA, which is external owned account. That's precisely an account uh, associated with a certain private key. And this account is allowed to be active. What does it mean, active? It can initiate transactions. If you have a private key, you can initiate a transaction, obviously, transferring money from your account, for example. And there are other accounts which 
uh, are addresses of smart contracts uh, deployed in the system. Smart contracts are just uh, instructions for the Ethereum virtual machine. We will study the Ethereum virtual machine in detail in the next lecture. Uh, for now, it is just a very simple instructions, uh, set of instructions, uh, which uh, actually corresponds to this simplistic, very simplistic smart contract, which we will now discuss. So it is just block of bytes, it is byte code. Uh, if you count uh, the number of bytes here, uh, most instructions are very simple, single byte, but there are also immediate operands here. Then it is 250 something bytes here. 253, I think. This smart contract is translated into 253 bytes of byte code. Smart contracts are treated as special kind of data in the distributed uh, Ethereum uh, blockchain. And when a transaction is made with the destination being a smart contract, then what do you think happens? The smart contract is executed. And the argument is precisely the data being carried by that transaction. So this smart contract is called faucet. What is faucet in English? A tap, like a water tap. Uh, actually, it is not a water tap, it is a beer tap. Imagine a large uh, barrel of beer, you come to it, you open up this faucet at tap, uh, and you uh, fill in your glass. So that's precisely what it can do. This contract allows, it is a nice one, everyone to take money from your account. So your account is indeed a barrel of beer. This smart contract allows everyone to get beer or actually money from your account. How? It implements a function, which is obviously called withdraw. Withdraw from whom? From you. Because you are the owner of this smart contract. Uh, amount to be withdrawn. It is a public method. Uh, the amount is given in for Bitcoin, the smallest unit is called Satoshi. It is 10 to the power minus 18 over Bitcoin. Uh, Ethereum which had the Ethereum ETH uh, cryptocurrency associated with it. Actually, Ethereum has two standard cryptocurrencies associated with the network and multiple other cryptocurrencies created uh, using the Ethereum uh, uh, network, but two are already embedded in the sense that the Ethereum virtual machine is aware of those cryptocurrencies. One is Ethereum itself, ETH, and the other cryptocurrency is what? If you remember, maybe you have heard about it. The second cryptocurrency, which is embedded into the Ethereum network and uh, the virtual machine knows about it because it is essential for operation of the, of the virtual machine. You have heard the term gas, I, uh, I believe, have you? What is gas? Gas like uh, a petrol uh, used to run our cars. Actually, British petrol is American gas. 
why is it necessary? Okay, imagine this function. This function is very simple. It checks that the withdrawal amount, if you count the number of zeros here, there are 17 zeros, which means that uh, your withdrawal amount is up to 0 0.1 Ethereum. You can't withdraw more, but you can execute the smart contract over and over and over again, withdrawing and withdrawing and withdrawing. It runs in a certain environment, which is provided by the virtual machine, Ethereum virtual machine, and the objects, standard objects from this environment, exposed by the virtual machine API, are named on the contract. So message is precisely the transaction which initiated execution of this smart contract. So this is a transaction sent by someone to you to the address of your smart contract. Obviously it has a sender. From message, from the transaction, you know who the sender is. There is a standard method supported by the virtual machine uh, because the virtual machine, although it is a general purpose distributed computational environment, really Web3, which allows you to uh, perform in general arbitrary computations using arbitrary distributed data. So for example, you can run SETI at home on the Ethereum network. Definitely you can. And maybe even such implementations do exist, not only in uh, the, using the original grid uh, protocols, but uh, quite possibly uh, such implementations do exist over Ethereum. There are some problems with that I will explain in a second. But here it is very simple. It's not an arbitrary computation. It is something which the virtual machine is aware of that still, apart from general purpose Web3 distributed computations over distributed data, you do have Ethereum monetary transfers. There is still Ethereum currency. And therefore there is a method, predefined method called transfer means transfer from you to the sender, the amount specified, which is a very simple transaction, uh, basically single, nearly single instruction uh, executed by the virtual machine. It contains some call to uh, the corresponding virtual machine instruction, uh, to, to, to uh, the, API, uh, the API method. So it is just a simple call, but you can implement an arbitrary control flow in your function with the row. In particular, you can implement even an infinite loop. And what would it mean? It would mean that this smart contract is deployed across the whole network, all right? And then you send a transaction to this smart contract and each and every Ethereum node starts running your smart contract in an infinite loop. This is clearly not acceptable. So you need some kind of uh, balance between, on one hand, Turing completeness of your language. So yes, you are in general able to uh, run arbitrary computations, but on the other hand, uh, you must really preclude unnecessary use of network resources uh, or indeed uh, denial of service attacks uh, on the whole Ethereum network, which would be extremely easy if everyone could submit uh, a non-terminating or uh, I would say very expensive smart contract, uh, we then uh, each and every node would try to execute. And this problem 
is precisely addressed uh, in Ethereum by using the notion of gas. Gas is another cryptocurrency which uh, is used uh, in Ethereum in order to pay for execution of your smart contract. Gas has a certain price. It is not Ethereum itself, but it is exchanged for Ethereum. Moreover, it is exchanged for Ethereum at the price which you by yourself specify. So for example, a very simple, uh, let's say single operation uh, smart contract like this, uh, when the virtual machine runs the smart contract, it counts the cost of all instructions executed because it is a virtual machine, it works as an interpreter. So counting the cost is easy. With each instruction, there is a gas cost associated and it subtracts uh, this gas cost from uh, the original amount of gas uh, you provided. So uh, once you're on to zero, then there is no more way of how your smart contract could be executed and it gets aborted. Uh, for example, for this one, the standard, uh, very, very uh, simplistic uh, cost of um, executing the smart contract is uh, 21,000 units of gas, where a single unit of gas could be something like, for example, 10 to minus eight uh, of uh, Ethereum. So overall, this would be about 10 to minus five of Ethereum or something like this. Uh, the cost of executing this extremely simple smart contract. So the cost is pretty small for a single operation. Um, when you send a transaction to a smart contract, the transaction and in general, any transaction uh, in Ethereum, it can contain Ethereum value and data. So two types of uh, uh, data, uh, specific Ethereum value plus data. Now, if you, suppose that in the generic case you have both you generated a transaction which contains Ethereum value and data and send it to the ordinary EOA external owned account. Let's actually maybe draw these possibilities on a whiteboard. Can you see the whiteboard? Okay, Any turn, uh, an arbitrary transaction, it contains um, Ethereum value and data and or data. Suppose that this transaction is destined to uh, the general EOA this is general general account. Once again, the most important feature of this general account is that it has a private key. Okay, what happens in this case? Well, Ethereum value minus transaction costs are added to your account. Incremented. What happens with the data which are sent to your general account, EOA? If a data are sent to EOA, what do you think would happen?
data is simply ignored. There is nothing you can do with it. Ethereum value is used to increment the value of your account, data are ignored. Now, if the same Ethereum value and data are sent to, actually there are three, no, four types of accounts. The third and the fourth are similar to some extent, um, and we are discussing them. So the first type of account in Ethereum is indeed EOA, general account with a parent key. The second type of account is precisely an account associated with a deployed smart contract. Excuse me, are, yes. but in the, in the first uh, type of accounts, are the data being stored or are they completely like erased? Data is completely ignored. Okay. Your account only had the Ethereum value associated with it. I mean, uh, obviously <laughs> erased, uh, it depends. All transactions are still memorized in the, uh, in, uh, in the network. But there is no value as data associated with your account. It's not that, for example, if then more data are sent to your account, then there is a growing, uh, let's say, concatenation of data strings associated with your account. There was a transaction destined to your account. You can still have a look at that transaction, find it in uh, the corresponding block, and you will see, yes, uh, there was an Ethereum value associated uh, with it and data. So you can really uh, still recover that there was a data sent to your account, but it has no meaning. You can find it in, it, in the transaction, but it doesn't trigger any uh, action and effectively does not update the state of your account. But, but the complexity of, well, yeah. For so. that it is essentially ignored, right? Yes, but uh, the complexity of retrieving data, let's say from 1,000 uh, transactions before, it's really hard, right? Because it's, oh, it's, it's really hard, absolutely, but there is no point to. If it is a general EOA account, it is not supposed to receive data. Okay. If you like, for example, to develop a third party application, which looks up data inadvertently, uh, inadvertently sent to your account, with no particular purpose, you can do that, but it is not intended. Yeah, thank you. Ignored simply because data are not supposed to be sent to EOA, All right? Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Now, if the address to which the account to which uh, this transaction is sent is that of a deployed smart contract rather than EOA, then the situation becomes much different. So first of all, ETH value still added to the account, to smart contract, I, I write a C, to smart contract account. Why is it important to add uh, ETH value to the smart contract account? Because ETH value, as we have seen, can then be subtracted from the account. You can make a transaction sending this data to someone, all right? I will now open both actually windows so you can see we need both. Here, uh, there is a certain method, uh, nameless, function, public, payable, without any body. It is uh, a default operation, uh, which uh, actually means that uh, if a transaction is sent to a smart contract account without naming which function to call, and without any data, 
then uh, this is a default method, which simply means that uh, transactions, uh, that the corresponding funds will be added to the account. It is always uh, a required default. You can do another default, actually. But typically, uh, if uh, funds are sent, then this method, uh, by the way, it is not, uh, not a default behavior in the virtual machine. You still need to provide it in your smart contract, uh, which results in uh, funds to be added to your smart contract account. OK. But the data are parsed. And typically, the data are the following. The data destined for a smart contract is a four byte prefix, which is a hash of the method signature. And this is the method to be, invo to be invoked. Signature includes name and argument types, as usual. It is converged into a certain unified representation. Uh, a string, a hash of that string is taken. By the way, um, you remember Bitcoin. What was the length of hashed uh, data, the standard hash used in Bitcoin? One hundred sixty bit hash. You remember Ethereum a bit longer for stronger safety. Two hundred fifty six bit hashes. Uh, the hashing algorithm, which is used in Ethereum. In Bitcoin, you remember it was a two-stage uh, hash, uh, and these two stages are collectively just known as hash 160. Uh, in Ethereum, uh, the hashing technology is called TechTac 256, which was a candidate implementation for the standard uh, called SHA-3. But it is not the same as SHA-3. Uh, when this hash was first implemented, then standardization was already in process, then amendments were introduced, and effectively they appeared to be both 256 bit long, but slightly different. That's the standard used in uh, Ethereum. So it is a hash of the method signature. And by then, uh, the virtual machine precisely knows which method is to be used. And uh, then arguments, like withdraw amount, plus these are just data, but data are part of the whole message object, if you remember. And this message object, in particular, contains the Ethereum value. And uh, your method may have access to all fields. In particular, uh, it knows the sender, it knows uh, uh, the value, uh, and so on and so on. So that's what happens when you make a transaction with the destination address being that of a deployed smart contract. The third possibility is when you send this to a special account with the address equal to zero. What do you think zero address in Ethereum does? Like null pointer. What is a zero address? There is some important piece of functionality which we did not consider yet. We said, okay, there are smart contracts deployed in the system. How do they get there? 
at the rate zero is precisely for smart contracts deployment. Default destination address, special one for smart contract deployment. When a transaction containing Ethereum value and data are sent to address zero, what do you think happens? Well, data is the byte code of your smart contract. The smart contract is compiled into byte code locally at your local node. And then it is sent to all other nodes. So basically you first compile it, then you inject it into the uh, Ethereum network. So, okay, data is precisely the byte code. What is the Ethereum value? If you send both data and Ethereum value to address zero, Ethereum value are lost, simply lost. So they do not become Ethereum value associated with your deployed smart contract. No, don't make this mistake. You first need to deploy your smart contract by sending it to address zero. As a result, you will obtain in this transaction, you will obtain the address of your deployed smart contract. Then you send funds to the address of your deployed smart contract, not to the address zero. There is no private key associated with address zero. And moreover, there is no smart contract associated with address zero. It is a built-in system functionality. So if funds as an Ethereum value are sent to address zero, there is absolutely no way of making use of those funds anymore. So they are lost or burned. And sometimes, it is difficult to imagine, but sometimes it does happen that you need to burn your Ethereum values deliberately. In that case, it's better not to send it to address zero because you simply overload the system. Address zero is for smart contract deployment. Deliberate destruction of ETH value. Send your Ethereum value and data to the address with a special hexadecimal address called DAD and it will be destroyed. Obviously the data are ignored, your Ethereum value is lost forever, if you do that. The whole network is like the following. So you have nodes, Ethereum nodes, so suppose that this is your node, which is in peer-to-peer -peer communication to other nodes. Your node typically contains a database of blocks and it is a big one. Uh, in uh, obviously it is up to implementation uh, how to implement it uh, but uh, because it is uh, quite a large one uh, the implementation should be uh, reasonably efficient and it is an open source implementation from google 
uh, which is used uh, uh, typically in most node implementations. Uh, there is a virtual machine to execute uh, smart contracts and also there is a client API which allows uh, standardized uh, clients for example, with a graphical user interface to interact with your nodes. Uh, there are many uh, different clients uh, and different node implementations. So for, uh, the protocol is the same, but node implementations are different. So uh, there is one called Parity implemented in Rust. And this is considered to be uh, probably the most state of the art. Uh, there is a get implementation. You can imagine that it is Go. Uh, there is a CPP Ethereum. Uh, in C++ and so on. Moreover, uh, again, uh, there could be a full node implementation and some kind of uh, interface nodes only, which only allow you to observe the existing transactions, but probably they would not uh, uh, make the whole copy uh, of uh, the blockchain, let alone they would not do any hashing. Uh, so uh, even there are implementations running in your browser uh, in JavaScript, which are very good uh, to familiarize yourself uh, and to start with uh, Ethereum. Uh, there are clients uh, implementing in particular your wallet infrastructure. Wallet infrastructure is relatively difficult to implement because what you need to do is to ensure the proper storage of your keys. Storing a key is easy when it is just one private key. But suppose that it is a kind of institutional environment in which uh, really maybe hundreds or thousands of keys, imagine that it is an exchange like a crypto exchange, Binance. There are really millions of participants and the exchange must store the keys. So it should use a trusted, dependable client infrastructure in particular in order to store the keys because the keys actually physically belong to the exchange, but legally they control funds which belong to the clients. And any theft of keys from the exchange would do uh, an unlimited damage uh, to the business. Therefore, enterprise-wide key storage is a very important part of technology. Uh, what is typically done is uh, using a hierarchical uh, storage site uh, that uh, probably most of the funds are stored offline, it is so-called air gap. So there is some kind of offline key storage, which are not even connected to, uh, or at least not permanently connected to uh, the main uh, online client. And when funds transfer is required, uh, then uh, you would typically uh, type in a passphrase or a key manually over this air gap. Air gap means uh, no electronic connectivity uh, in order to make the corresponding transaction. So this offline key storage is typically uh, separated by an air gap from the client. And 
the client, I mean not the node, by the client, would typically have a JSON RPC based API so that, uh, for example, you can create uh, JSON objects and communicate with the client. It's an important point, actually. You communicate with the client and the client then communicates with the node. It is a preferred way rather than you directly communicate with the node. Why? Even if the node is running locally. Because in that case, your uh, software, which produces the JSON object, must act as a client, for example, with respect to key storage. It is undesirable. It's better to leave all this secure key storage functionality to a standardized client, well-tested, dependable, and so on. And if you need any scripting capability, then you submit this JSON object uh, based scripts to the client, and uh, the client is already uh, executing uh, an internal connection to the node, and the node executes connections to the peers. Then the typical node architecture in uh, Ethereum. I think we are done for today. Next time on Thursday, we will do Ethereum virtual machine in detail. And in order to get sufficient time for everything, on Thursday we'll start early again at 9 a.m. 9 a.m. on Thursday, not 10.40. Please wake up and be ready. Any questions? If none, thank you. And we're meeting on Thursday 9 a.m. Thank you.